who never leaves us nor forsakes us, who never disappoints us, who always gives us more than we need, and has promised to see us all the way through. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're looking at verses 14 to 19. Last week we, we looked at verses 14 and 15 together. This, this uh, overarching theme, encouraged by the gospel. Timothy, Paul wanted Timothy to be encouraged by the gospel. And he gives him several of these as we've already seen them as we're moving through this letter. And this idea that you can be approved by God in a day that disapproves of an awful lot. In fact, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been approved by God. And so what I want to do is I want us to read these verses together again, and we'll look at, at 16, 17, 18, and 19 today. I would ask you to stand with me if you would. I hope you have your Bible. Follow along in your Bible. If not, we have the text on the screens for you because we want you to see the Word, gaze upon the Word, as well as hear it. Paul says to Timothy, remind them of these things, charging them before the, the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. So immediately there's this idea of, of the striving with words. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun pr profane and idle babblings. He's, he's now continuing to think about this use of the tongue. For they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now I've just read to you what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And if we receive it as such, and say, Lord, speak to my heart, not just my mind, my heart, the words that we've just read, make them grip me, then, then we will see ourselves living diligently by grace, our feet firmly planted, not shaking, coming apart in a culture that sees so much of that happening in their own lives and around them. Thank you. Be seated. Let's, let's unpack these verses here for the next few minutes. I told you last week, that when we look at this passage, I see it unfolding under four headings. First, remember to make the gospel the main thing. We looked at that. Second, reflect the transforming truth of God in your life. Reflect upon that, the transform, and, and reflect that to others, this transforming truth of God in your life. We said to you over and over, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Christians should be compassionate, we should be caring, we should be tender toward one another and toward others. Today we want to look at these two. Refuse to allow your tongue to lead you into ungodliness. And then fourth, rest in the solid foundation of God. Let's, let's see this together. Now this, this idea of refusing to allow your tongue to lead you into ungodliness. He's already spoken in the previous verse words of no property, un unprofitable words, empty words. But he picks it up again. But shun. The word shun there is stay away from. Remove yourself from. Sometimes the most sanctified thing you can do is walk away. If you can't get someone to change the topic, I mean, there are people, we've all had them in our lives, who when you get around them, they simply take you down. They wear you down. Their words are so negative. They're so, they're so critical. They're so, that you just, you walk away and you go, oh, gosh. And the scripture is very clear here. Shun profane and idle babblings. For they will increase to more ungodliness. And what, what you seem saying here is that, that those kind of talk, and, and use the word the babble, and that's, that's the, the word there really. It's uh, just blah, 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 blah. blah. It's, that that's ungodly. But they increase... They increase to more ungodliness. It's, this is a graphic image, but, you know, sometimes when, when people verbally vomit on you, now you, you've got it on you. And that's the picture he's using here. 
that they increase to more ungodliness. See, it doesn't say that, 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 that profane and idle babblings open the door to ungodliness. They increase it because it in itself is ungodliness. Well, what do you mean? Well, the scripture teaches, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for, for edifying, for building up. And we all fail at this. That's, that's the thing. I'm, I'm not standing here today saying to you, I hope you folks will figure this out and join me in this. No. We all fail in this. We all struggle with this. But yet the scripture is very clear about it, about the tongue. In fact, he, he says their message, whatever that message is, if it's, if it's not edifying, if it's not glorifying God and exalting Christ and building up people and, and, and giving the aroma of the gospel, it is like a cancer. Now, you know what that picture is. That's, it is it's deadly. It is, it's killing. I've told you before that the time in my life and with my children, and I, and I hate thinking back on it, that they probably would rather that I had just taken a stick and beat them with a stick because at least that pain would have healed more quickly. And he cites too, and you know, we, we, when we read this, we, that, anytime you hear Paul calling names in his letters, we ought to take a deep breath and go, oh my goodness, if Paul, if Paul were my pastor, if Paul spent some time among them, would he call my name in a letter uh, like this? Hymenaeus and Philetus, he says, they're of this sort. Their specific sin is that they were, they were wagging their tongues, he says they've strayed from the truth, saying that the resurrection's already passed. Now you read that and you go, what in the world? Somebody at the first century was doing that? Folks, I was pastoring in a church in Clinton, Louisiana, and down the road was a, was a fellow who was a pastor who was working on his doctorate at a, at a seminary not too far from, from there. And a guy came to me one day and he said, he said, I'm really concerned. I said, what? He said, well, I was leading the music uh, for a meeting at this particular church, and, and the fellow told me, he said, I want you to, to sing on the on the coming of Christ and he said well don't you mean the second coming he said well, I didn't say the second coming there's no second coming and so it shocked him and so I this fellow and I had occasion to bump into one another and we began to talk and sure enough he believed that Jesus was not coming again that there wasn't going to be this great resurrection in the end he was pastoring a Southern Baptist Church this is not thank God it's not completely common but it's not uncommon completely either in the 20th 21st century that's their, that's their sin. But don't, don't make yourself feel better here going well. That was a doctrinal sin. It was, a, it was using the tongue to deny the resurrection. That was his particular issue, their particular issue. But, but the very language he uses warns us. And so I just want to give you, a, let's just do a panorama real quickly. Just to remind you of how much the scripture addresses this matter of the use of the tongue. So let's, let's hang on. You ready? You might want to just jot the passages down. They're going to be up on the screen. Proverbs 10, 19 warns us. We ought to know this. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. The more we talk, the more we open to open ourselves to sinning with our tongues. Okay? We ought to try to keep our, our guard. Our, in fact, the, the best people, the best leaders in the world are listeners. They learn. They learn from people. So guard against that. In a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. So just mark it down as a truism. <clears throat> the longer I carry on in the conversation with somebody, the more I open my up, myself up to sinning with my tongue. He who restrains his lips is wise. The wise person knows to, to check this. It's not a gag order, but it's just a good rule of thumb. Second, Psalm 34 uh, 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Psalm 39, 1. I said I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. In addition, I'm going to guard my ways, I'm going to guard my life lest I sin with my tongue. The particular danger of that. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. And I don't know that we ought to all wear devices, on, but, but you, you hear the seriousness of the psalmist here? I'll restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. Proverbs 13, 3. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. In other words, a person 
and, and I'm, we're working right now with our granddaughter who, who uh, lives with us, soon to be five, and we instruct her. But I just want to, and so we actually had a drill last night. She didn't know I was, had already studied this for to preach on, so we had a drill. And I said, come here. I heard what you were just saying to your grandmother. I want to go back to, I'm, I'm going to say what she said, and I want you to respond like you did. And so we set it up. She did, and I raised my hand. Stop. Well, she didn't make it the first time, but it's okay. Well, let's try it again. So we did the same thing, I stopped, and she stopped immediately. I said, no. Because she told me, she said, well, careful, I just, I just can't, sometimes I can't. I said, no, you can. No one controls your tongue except you. So we had a little teachable moment there. So we practiced it a few times. And we actually walked it back to where, when her grandmother told her what she was telling her, that the answer was just, yes, ma'am. Which was all that was needed, by the way. <laughs> The scripture is, is help, trying to help us here. Guard your mouth, preserve your life. Show that you don't care what anybody's going to open your mouth. You're gonna, I'm going to have my say. I don't. That leads to destruction. The scripture is very clear about that. Your destruction. And you destroy other people along the way. Proverbs 15, 1 and 2. The 15th chapter of Proverbs has several of these things. A soft answer turns away wrath. We know that. That's why the scripture says our, our words ought to be wholesome, edifying, seasoned with grace. But a harsh word stirs up anger. That's what I call in my counseling, premarital counseling and marital counseling, verbal jousting. Attack somebody with your tongue. They're not likely to go, well, gee, thank you for sharing. Nope. They're going to defend. They're going to, they're just, it's a defensive maneuver. It's, we, God made us to protect ourselves. A soft answer turns away wrath. Harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. But the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Again in Proverbs 15, verse 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. So, so now it's, it, it's not just what comes out of the mouth. It's what was, was, in, the, was in the heart, was in the mind anyway. And the, what, the, what he's teaching here is remember that even if you, if you keep from saying it sometimes to somebody, which is where we ought to start is backing that up, that the Lord knows your thoughts and they're an abomination to him. What you thought about saying. In verse 28, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Studies how to answer. Stops. Thinks. Speaks. Not just pouring forth whatever's on my mind, whatever I felt like saying. Going through some checkpoints. Is this true? Is it edifying? Is it timely? Is this the time to share it? Ask yourself some things. All right, in verses 31 to 33, the ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction, see now, so I know as I'm saying this to people, I'm saying to myself, that there are people that are going to take this and blow it off. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul. He who heeds rebuke gets understanding. All right. Then Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Have you heard the adage, better to keep your mouth closed and be thought a fool than to open it and remove all doubts? That's where this comes from. It's an adage drawn from this, this proverb. A fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. But when he, when he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. All right, Proverbs 18, 6 to 8. I want to move through these. I've got a couple more here. A fool's lips enter into contention. His mouth calls for blows. That's the paraphrase there is sometimes people say things that just make you want to punch them in the nose. That's a loose paraphrase of that. When they won't shut up. A fool's mouth is his destruction. His lips are the snare of his soul. Then, of course, James. We know from James chapter 1 
in verses 26, and then that longer passage in James 3. We're just going to cite it because this is, this is not a message about the tongue today, but it's, it's instructive. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, chapter 1, verse 26, and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. It's the same kind of language being used about empty words, idle babbling. Your religion is useless. How can you ultimately help others if you can't restrain and, and harness your tongue? And of course, James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, he talks about how we stumble. Verse 2, if a, if a man who doesn't stumble in word is a, is a perfect, a complete man. Uh, if, you can, if you can harness your tongue, it's a, it's a manifestation of self-control, harnessing the tongue that will allow you to uh, harness other aspects of life. That's what he's saying. And then he uses these analogies. We put bits in horses' mouths. Ships are steered and controlled by a small rudder. And in verse 5, even the tongue is a little member boasting great things and like a, it's like a spark that burns down forests if it's not controlled. It's a fire, a world of iniquity, verse 6. And then that kind of a tongue, he says, it is set on fire by hell. In other words, the Spirit of God does not prompt me and you to unload on somebody verbally. That's not spiritual. It comes from another place. And then he, who can tame the tongue, he says. So he, he warns against the blessing of God. In other words, the idea of being here in worship, blessing the Lord in, with our songs, with our, with our statements, with our scripture readings, our affirmations, and then taking that same tongue and cursing one another on the way here, on the way home, or later. I mean, it's, so that shouldn't be. These things should not be. So that's on the tongue. The fourth thing. Rest in the solid foundation of God. In the light of all these things he said, nevertheless, he says, the, found, the solid foundation of God stands, or the found, foundation of the Lord stands sure, that's another way, one of the translations. The solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. You know, sometimes, sometimes we carry on as if we, we want to make that our business. God has called us to reflect his glory to the peoples, to share the good news of a crucified and risen Savior, to recognize that we've been blessed to be a blessing. Mark it down, folks. I've done pastoral counseling, marriage counseling for, more, for 35 years plus now. And I've been married longer than that, so my wife's been on the receiving end of a lot of my, a lot of my, my blunders. We are not here to fix anybody else. The Lord has not called you or me to fix anyone. He has called us to be receptive to the fix that is the gospel. And work on my soul, Lord. Work on my mind. Capture my heart. One of the, one of the devil's most clever ploys is to convince you and me that the problems we have in life are because of other people. Let me say, mark it down. The problems you and I have in life are because of our unsanctified conduct, our remaining sin that we're not conquering, that we're not putting to death, that we're not subduing. How can you say that, Pastor? Because there are people all over the world this day who are dying for the faith, who've been doing that very thing, and they don't see their peop the people who are killing them as the problem. And if that's the case of martyrs, then we've got to get over our first world issues and realize that the Lord has called us to be fixed by the gospel. He's not called us to fix anybody else. The Lord knows those that are his. That is not a challenge. That means we become unevangelistic or unconcerned, not because there's too many scriptures otherwise. But what it does mean is that we're not the ones that go around trying to fix everybody else. There is a fix for us, though, and that's the rest of the verse, by the way. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You see, if I name the name of Christ, and I, I'm spending all my energy, all my time, or in a disproportionate amount of my time, trying to fix people, we say, well, isn't that what you do with counseling? No. 
I'm not that naive about counseling. I can't fix anybody, but I'll tell you what I can do. I can, we can talk about the gospel, wash one another in the gospel, rejoice in the gospel, make challenges that come out of the gospel. And if people will lay hold of the gospel, not, not Bill Askell's wisdom, the gospel, it will transform from the inside out. How do I know that? Because God's been doing that in my life for a lot of years now, and there's a lot more that needs to be done yet. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's our challenge. We're not here to get, to get, this is where I think the Christian church in America has blown it so significantly. Because we have spent years and years trying to tell homosexuals they shouldn't be homosexuals. Trying to tell people who want to have abortions they shouldn't have abortions. And folks, they shouldn't have abortions. But what if, what if we were investing that same amount of time in our own lives to be the, to be the, the reflection of the glory of God in the face of Christ, to be peaceable, to be pure, to be thinking on the things that promote peace, to let our light so shine before men that they will see our good works that flow out of, flow out of our wanting to be fixed by the gospel, that they will see our good works and they will be constrained to glorify our Father in heaven. They won't have to be convinced by us to quote, quit their sinning. They're sinners. What do we expect sinners to do other than sin? But it's so easy because we want to fix everybody else. We want to fix our spouses. We want to fix our kids. We want to fix our neighbors. We want to fix the people we work with. We want to fix those horrible people out there that do all those horrible things. And we, if, we're, if we're clever enough, we can spend all our time to fix one another and we won't spend the time letting the gospel be the fix in our lives that we so desperately need. There's great hope in this verse here. God's foundation stands sure, sealed with His promise. I remember Karen and I clinging to that when, when we had our first miscarriage. A little human person not living to see and breathe this atmosphere. Clinging to that, the Lord knows those who are His. Those we've ministered to through the years and then we've, we've, we've journeyed on. We're not with them now. Perhaps they've died. We shared the gospel with them, prayed for them. How did they die? We, we don't always know. We're not universalists. We're not going to say, well, because they died, we know they went to heaven. But we're not going to be, we're not going to be utter pessimists and say, well, I didn't ever see them confess faith. No. The Lord knows those who are His. And we cling to that. That's, that's His word to us about everybody else. And his word to us about ourselves is, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And in that passage we read, and I'm going to close with this in one more. Verse 28 of Hebrews 12. Since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Folks, have you noticed? I mean, newspapers, radios, email, news alerts, websites, TV. This foundation being shattered. This foundation being shattered. This happening politically. This happening morally. This happening socially. Just all around us. Things that very honestly, I've said before, you and I never dreamed. We never imagined it would. What's it going to do to us? You know what? In the face of that, no matter how it personally affects us, if it personally affects 401Ks, if it personally affects where our neighborhood, where we're living, it personally affects what the government's going to do to us. There are, there are right now in this country chaplains who are, who are being censored because he, bare, he, he dared to write an article, there are no atheists in foxholes. And he is incurring the wrath of the military and the wrath of the atheist community who are calling for his dismissal. That's just one snapshot. Pastor arrested in, in, in Arizona for holding a Bible study in his home. That's another. We can go on and on and list all the horrible things happening. But see, I don't tell you those things so you go, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? No, no. What we do is we go, boom, boom. We plant our feet firmly on the foundation that is unshakable in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And as everybody else sees everything they're standing on coming apart at the seams, then we're in a glorious position. If our feet are planted, boom, boom, we're in a glorious position to reach down. And give a hand up. Say, come on up, friend. I want to introduce you to the solid rock. 
all the sinking sand around you, all that you thought was a sure foundation, I want to introduce you to the solid rock. Unmovable, unchangeable, steady to the end. Look, look, see, we're standing. Our knees are not buckling. Our hands are not being wrung in despair. We're not going around singing woe is me with you. We stand on the solid rock. So, Jesus closed his sermon on the mount with a passage I want to simply read to you. Take the application. Matthew 7, 21 to 27. I'm always aware that when I speak these things that there could be some among me who, who have Im imbibed and embraced religion but have not embraced Jesus Christ. Jesus was aware of that too, by the way, so this is how he closed the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does or who practices the will of my Father in heaven. In other words, we, we talked today about what to do, what not to do. What, the question is, will you practice it? Will you practice the gospel? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And that's preachers. Cast out demons in your name. That's these miracle workers. And done many wonders in your name. That's mir You see, the argument here is if, if these folks have not got it made, then who does? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, now that's his, that's his commands. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not, and, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, on the firm foundation of the gospel of grace, advancing the kingdom of God. That's what we're talking about there. And the rain descended and the floods came and winds blew. And that's where we live right now, folks. The rains are coming down. The floods are coming up. The winds are knocking everything loose. And beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded upon the rock. You see, how we respond in crisis says more about where we're standing than it does about the crisis. And the rain descended and the floods came. And it stood. But, verse 26, everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Doesn't matter if he called it a rock. Doesn't matter if, he was to, if, if his worldview said, well, we're assured that this is rock. We're assured that somewhere beneath this kind of soft substance is solid rock. Doesn't matter what people said. Doesn't matter what he believed. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew. Very same words, very same circumstances. And beat on that house and it fell. And its fall was great. In other words, it was tragic. So what foundation are you standing on today? We, we want to verbally say, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing Christ my Lord and Savior, and I pray to God that is true of everyone here who says that, and I pray that anyone who has not yet said that will soon declare God as your Savior. But I'm going to tell you something. True or not true, whether you confessed or not confessed, the winds are blowing, the rain is falling, the floods are coming. And only those whose feet are firmly, and their lives firmly planted on the rock will withstand the cultural collapse that is post-America. Where do you stand? Where do you stand? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of many of you that you stand on the solid rock of Christ. Your lives have demonstrated that as you've gone through your own personal tragedies. But folks, I'm not a doomsday prophet. It's going to get, if there was ever any question. You know, years ago when people were saying, boy, it's going to get bad here, folks are going, bad? I mean, goodness, the moral majority, we've got the moral majority going, we've got, we got presidents being elected in office that, that seem to think kind of like we do or at least appreciate what we do. Man, we've got, if anyone ever questioned that, no more. No more. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to challenge you and encourage you. It's going to get a lot worse. But you know what? It will not affect the unshakable kingdom of our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Plant your lives there. Get on the rock firmly fixed on the rock. And as everything comes apart, what a great, 
what a great rescue ministry we can be involved in rescuing person after person relative friend neighbor co-worker as we're able to give them an answer for the reason that we have hope when all around them seems hopeless